evening, everyone. It's good to see you all today. Uh, with the Word of God today in Matthew chapter 20, in verse 1 through 16. Right, Matthew chapter 20 from verse 1, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again on this, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour he, and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages and beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. Uh, so when those came, those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. And the title of today's message is The Parable of the Workers in the Vineyard. So we'll look at today's message with that title, The Parables of the Workers in the Vineyard. So today's parable is one that I find most interesting, but very hard to understand. Uh, but I hope uh, through looking deeply at today's message, um, I hope that we can gain a deeper understanding. So why are parables important? Parables teach us an underlying truth about ourselves that may not be so obvious. You know, it's one thing to look at the text of a parable, but it's a whole other thing to look at the subtext meaning behind it. You know, so there's what's written, but there is an underlying meaning underneath it. And we have to look at the subtext of this text. And so I hope uh, this parable, it can give us a very different perspective on God's grace. And it will help us live newly uh, as Jesus is encouraging us here to live newly in this parable. I hope it can be these words. So first of all, uh, let's clarify some misunderstandings of this parable. Uh, so from one, verse 1 through 13, what we're really seeing is what is going on and the beginnings of the conversation that the landowner has, especially with some of the first ones that came, the early ones. So basically what is happening is uh, we have a landowner, right? We have a landowner and this landowner calls workers at 6 a.m. starting to work and he offers them uh, uh, one denarius, one denarius to begin working at 6 a.m. And then at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., three, all offering one denarius. And then he goes out at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, and still he offers that one denarius. He finds people that are still just laying around, not working, and, and so he offers them one denarius to work. So they come at 5 p.m., and so um, basically, whether you came early in the morning at 6 a.m., or whether you came at 5 p.m. and uh, the payment, you know, the, the wages are given at 6 p.m. So whether you came at, whether you came really early and worked the whole 12 hours, or you worked the last little bit for that one hour, everyone is getting the same one denarius. Now imagine if you were one of those people. Imagine if you were, you know, like on the docks, uh, ready to work for the construction. And uh, they, you know, they say, come to our construction site to work on, on, on it, right? And so you come early in the morning 
at 6 a.m. To, to work, and then you worked a whole full 12 hours of working that construction site, right? But, you know, there's also a guy that comes at 5 p.m. You know, he's only worked one hour. So you've been carrying all this cement and, you know, carrying all the beams and, and, and doing the construction work for a very long time. And you've been doing that for 12 hours. And there's this other guy who's only been doing it one hour. And so he calls, the owner calls everybody at the 6 p.m. And he starts with the people that came last. So the 5 p.m. are the ones that are getting their wages first. And so all the 6 a.m. people, they, they see you know, how much wages he's getting and they're getting you know, one denarius, same as, as you're getting. And so now you begin to understand this complaint, right? I mean, the 6 a.m. guys, they've got this argument towards the owner. They're saying, you know, those 5 p.m. guys who came just for one hour, why are they, why don't we get more than them, right? Why aren't we getting more wages than them? We worked for 12 hours, but these 5 p.m. guys, they're just getting the same thing as us. And so how does the owner respond to that? He says, well, didn't you agree? You agreed to that, right? You agreed at the beginning of the day. When I called you at 6 a.m., I said, I'm going to give you a denarius for a full day's work. So didn't you agree to that one denarius? That's true, right? They got exactly what was promised them. So now we begin to see two sides here, right? On one hand, the owner is right. They got what was promised. They're complaining, essentially, about the owner's generosity. So... Uh, that's one picture. That's one perspective. The owner, the owner is right. They got what they were promised. But there's the other side too. It just doesn't seem fair, right? It doesn't seem fair. You know, working 12 hours and working one hour, it's a huge, huge difference. And shouldn't it be that each person should get accordingly to how much they have worked? And so, now you see what is going on here. There's two different perspectives, right? There's the owner's perspective and the owner has his standard. And then the workers too. Uh, the workers have their own standards of what is fair, how much I've worked, how much I received based on how much I've worked. And so we begin to see two different perspectives and two different standards here. And so uh, as we look at this message and we look deeply at this, what it speaks to really is our sense of fairness, our sense of justice, you know, our sense of what is, what is right, what is appropriate in, in situations and what, what we should deserve, right? Based on how long I worked, how much I should deserve. And we have our sense of, of fairness and justice of what I think is right. So very often it is like this. We want God to operate on my thoughts and my standards. Right? I have my way, I think, how much I worked and how much I receive. You know, I want God to operate on my thoughts and my standard. From my perspective, coming in at 6 a.m., I worked much longer and much harder. Right? Don't I deserve more? You know, isn't that just logical? I mean, doesn't that make sense? If I worked longer and I worked harder than that 5 p.m. guy, as the 6 a.m. guy, shouldn't I, shouldn't I deserve more? Isn't this logical? But today, what I want to deeply realize about our perspectives and our standards and our sense of fairness is actually how arrogant I can be. Right? How arrogant I can be, how prideful I can be when it comes to my own perspectives, my own standards, and my own judgments. As we look deeply on this message, this is what really pierces us. This is what really comes into my heart. That you know, all these thoughts I have about how long I worked and how much I received, uh, much of this is based on my perspective my arrogance, my pride, based on my standard and my judgment. You know, there's some people that they work at a company a very long time, but as they work at this company a very long time, 
uh, other people keep getting past them in terms of promotions. They get raises. And it seems like they've been here a long time, but they're just stagnant, right? And so, you know, what happens in these cases sometimes is they feel like the company owes them, right? They feel like the company owes me something. So, you know, there are occasions where people start committing petty theft to the company. Uh, they start stealing a few things here or there, you know, equipment from the office, and they start rationalizing it. You know, how much I did, how much I've, I've contributed to this company and all these other people that are just, you know, this way and that way, but, you know, how much uh, that I do, and they start rationalizing it based on themselves. Other people, they start, you know, even getting lazy, you know, leaving work early, taking advantage of whatever situation. Again, rationalizing. The company owes me. You know, I've been working a long time and working really hard, but the company keeps overlooking me and I'm not getting raises or promotions or, or whatnot. So, you know, when you look at the situation, especially from the company's perspective, the reality probably more than anything is that uh, the company has its own reasons for their decisions, right? For the good of the company, right? It's not based on the person or, or looking at that, but it's based on the reasons and decisions for the company. But the problem is, is that we have our own sinful self-centeredness, right? Judging by our own standard and not seeing the bigger picture. You know, the same thing occurs inside of the world. The same thing occurs to all of us. You know, so many people, we are too individualized. And everyone has their own standard of how they should live, right? We live in a very individualized world when you really think about it. Have you ever heard people go and tell you, you, know, you need to go find your own purpose. You need to go find meaning inside of your life. You need to find your, your passions. You need to, you need to look and, and find your legacy in the world. Now, there's people that, that talk about this. Now, of course, you know, this is good. There is a very good aspect about that. But we also forget to speak about the bad side about this. Now, the more we individualize, the more by ourselves we are individualizing, finding our own purpose and meaning and legacy in the world, we just begin more and more to, to rely on ourselves. And the more and more we rely on ourselves, the more and more we rely on ourselves to find our own meaning and our own purpose, what we find out is that we're weak, right? You know, if I keep trying to find my own meaning and my own purpose, then I find myself weak. Like I, you know, I can't do it. Like it's very hard. It's very hard, a person who relies on themselves. And so it's always, it's not always so good being so individualistic. Uh, the one who in the society which individualizes more, it lacks structure, right? It lacks something holding us sort of together like this. We, we need that. And so the truth is, is that we need God, right? <laughs> that, that is the ultimate, I guess, structure, you know, using the term I did before that we need. We need God. We need God to provide that foundation for us. It's in God that I find a bigger purpose for my life. It is God. This is what the Bible teaches us, that it is in God that we find our meaning for life. It is in God that we find eternity and our legacy inside of this world, right? It is only in God that we, we have that foundation, we have that structure. Individually, we are weak, but inside of God, you know, we find this purpose that we need. And so really this parable speaks to that. You know, it's speaking really, you know, it is just a, it's a parable. It's a story that Jesus is speaking about, but it's a story of contrasting perspectives. My perspective, the worker's perspective, and the owner's perspective, you know, my individualistic nature, and God also. And truly, it shows us, you know, how much, how much we're individualistic and how much we need God. So let's look at God's bigger picture. Let's read uh, the second part. And let's read in verse 14 and 15. So we... From verse 1 through 13, we're really looking at the sort of the situation and the start of this sort of back and forth between the first comers and, and the owner. But let's look at verse 14 and 15, then, and let's see what the, the owner is really saying here. It says, take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last 
the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the owner, he says, take your pay and go. I can do what I want. And he says a very deep thing here. He says, or are you envious because I am, gen and because I am generous? Are you envious because I am generous? So what this speaks to, what the owner is saying, and what Jesus is trying to say to us, is that we can see that God knows exactly what is going on inside of us. Now, Jesus challenges us to look closely at our standards of injustice and fairness. Remember earlier in the first, you know, when, in the first part of the message, I was saying, you know, we have our own standards of justice and fairness and, and what I think is right. But what the owner here is saying, are you envious because I'm generous? It's really examining that if the standard I am living by, the standard that I think is, is about justice and fairness, is the intention behind the standard, right? Is the intention behind the standard that I am creating, is that intention pure or not, right? That's what he's saying here. Are you envious because I am generous? So what that is saying basically is, is that if I was the 5 p.m. guy receiving grace, probably I wouldn't complain, right? Right, uh, if I'm the 5 p.m. guy and I'm receiving, I worked an hour and I received the full denarius, probably I wouldn't complain, right? If I was a 6 p.m. a.m. guy, but I just moved him over to be the 5 p.m. guy, even that 6 a.m. guy, wouldn't complain about about the situation but it's because i'm in the situation of the 6 a.m guy so i complain and therefore when you look at it what the owner is pointing out here is my true issue isn't about some righteous sense of what the standard should be right you know that's what we're saying but that's what we said in the first part right when it's when it's, when it's in my perspective, you know, how I think, how I operate under my own pride and my own arrogance is that, you know, I think it's so righteous, my standard of fairness, and I'm right, I worked longer and I worked harder, and why am I receiving the same as that guy? And I'm saying, I'm, and I'm being so righteous about my standard, but here the owner points out something <laughs> something very true here that the true issue isn't based on some righteous sense of my standard, but it's actually based on what position I'm in, right? That's what the actual issue here is. The core issue is my self-centeredness and my pride being shattered. And so that when grace is given to another person, right, it elicits envy, it elicits hostility inside of me. If grace is given to me, then I'm happy. But if it's given to someone else, then it's not fair. <laughs> when you really think about it, in actuality, how hypocritical is that? You know, it's very hypocritical when you think about it. You know, some of you know that, you know, I'm a big sports fan. And it's very interesting when you look at the economics of sports because you know it tends to be that it just keeps getting bigger and bigger every year the salaries when you know in the newspaper they report the salaries of these athletes it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and it's it's not just inflation you know we're not talking about how it's getting bigger just because you know inflation is growing it's getting bigger like beyond that and so what happens is, is that, you know, young stars, you know, the young star getting his contract, he makes this big, huge contract that gets splashed in the news. And it's way more than the older stars got in the past. And so, you know, when you think about it, you know, to make it fair, you know, shouldn't the young guy give a little bit of money to the old, the old guy, right? But, you know, never happens, you know, nothing like that ever happens. No, he's happy. You know, I got the big, I got the big money and he thinks it's because I'm a big star and right? I'm the greatest in the world. Right. And I should be paid because I'm going to help take this team to the next level or whatever. I'm the greatest in the world. Now, the older star, 
right? The older star seeing that that new star get his money in the newspaper. He thinks that young guy is only getting that money, that big contract because of the work I put in, right? I came before you. I set the table. I set the foundation for the sport to grow, right? Why is he getting the bigger contracts? It's because, you know, the TV deals are getting bigger. There's more publicity, you know. You know, there's all this advertising and so the money's getting bigger. That's based on the work I did, right? I, as the older star, I put in the work to grow the sport. And that's why it's become, that's why you're getting the, the bigger money, right? And so that's what he thinks. And so, you know, there's a lot of older stars that actually do think like that, that they should be getting some of the, a cut of the pay of how the sport grows like this. So the interesting thing about it is, though, is that one day, right, the young guy becomes the old guy. <laughs> it inevitably happens. And in sports, it happens fast, right? Within five years, you know, you become the old guy is what happens. And so the young guy becomes the old guy, and then the younger ones are making more money than him. <laughs> this is what happens. And so, you know, really, when you think about this situation, it's, it's quite humorous, in fact. You know, it is quite interesting, and it's quite humorous, in fact everybody is worried about how much denarius I'm getting, right? That is basically what the world is about, is about. You know, how much denarius, right? How much denarius am I getting? That is the standard inside of the world. You know, how much denarius I am getting. And that's the standard that so many, so many people go by. It's how much denarius I am getting. Really think about that for yourself. Really think about the standards in which you are living your life, which you are judging, which you compare to other people. You know, are you like that? Ask that question to yourself. You know, is, it, is, is that question I'm asking myself compared to that other person? You know, how much denarius am I getting? And we're just living by that, that kind of standard. Now, the owner, the owner is concerned more about the overall vineyard, right? That's what he cares about. It's not about denarius to this person or that person and how long this person or that person had worked. His standard is he wants to get that vineyard harvested. He wants to bear fruit out of this vineyard. He wants to see his vineyard do well, right? That, that's, that's what he's worried about, right? That, that's what the owner is worried about. And so that's really, when you really look at this, it's very interesting. Now, the truth is, is that God's standard is different than mine. You know, I'm all about the denarius. <laughs> That's what it is for me. I'm all about the denarius, how rich we are, or, or things like that, right? The world, the world creates its denarius, right? It could be money, right? That's often how much it is, right? That's what it often comes down to. It's about how much money I make. But there's other denarius in the world too. There is social status. There's my influence and power and fame. You know, all those denarius that I can gain in my life. And so when you look at the world, that's the world's perspective. This is the world's standard. It's based on those type of denarius. Right? It's, it's, the, it's the standard based on the denarius. Let's put it that way. Right? It's the standard based on the denarius. But for God, these things don't matter. Right? I mean, who cares about a denarius? Who cares about the wealth and social status, influence and fame and all these things? They're just temporary, right? They're inconsequential. These are temporary things. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19 and 20. Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19 and 20. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And so, you know, it teaches us, you know, the dichotomy of this, that, you know, treasures on earth, the, the denarius, they, they will just, you know, they will, moth and rust will destroy them. Thieves will break in and steal them, right? All those denariuses that we are basing our standards on, right? They're, they're, they're not lasting. They're temporary. They're inconsequential things to God. What does God care about? 
God cares about what is going to last. God is in the realm of eternity. What is going to last? He is the infinite God, the eternal God. And what is going to last? It's the vineyard, right? The vineyard is what remains. It's not the denarius. The denarius is given and then it's spent. But it is the vineyard that keeps remaining and keeps bearing fruit year after year. And it keeps going and it keeps bearing fruit. And so God cares about those things. God cares about the vineyard. The vineyard, the place where we can bear fruits of love. We can look at the vineyard as even the church, right? You know, that the vineyard is the church. This is the place where we must bear fruits of love. So how can I be stop being self-centered? And how can I stop being self-centered, judging things based on the standard of my denarius? We must stop living based on those things. If I am based, if I am living based on those temporary things, you know, I've got to shift my perspective. I must instead not use those temporary things as a basis, but my basis, like the owner, should be the vineyard, right? This is how we can be one with God. It's when my base is like God. It's like the vineyard bearing fruits of love. When we do this, you know, when we're in church, right, in church, when we're bearing fruits of love, that, that's what can remain, right? In the vineyard, that's what I can do. I can bear these fruits of love in church, and that's what can remain in the vineyard all the time. When we do this, then we can realize God's perspective, right? This is how precious it is to be in God's love. It remains like this. It's a, it's a foundation, right? That is completely different than the world. Really, I wish we can be, no, be these ones and look at things from God's perspective. So uh, as we look at this parable, it teaches us that profound uh, wisdom. And so let's look at the final part. Let's look at this final teaching that uh, Jesus gives us. This is in verse 16. So Matthew chapter 20. In verse 16, it teaches us some profound wisdom in life. Uh, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. So the, first, so the last will be first and the first will be last. So the last will be first and the first will be last. So this very profound and deep teaching that Jesus gives is that we are actually, in essence, both the first and the last ones. Right? That's what Jesus is saying here. We are both the first ones and the last ones. Right? What does that mean? It's that we are built, we are the last ones, right? right? We, we for sure are the last ones. We are built on the foundation of the first ones. That there are people that, that came before me. We are receiving benefit of the first ones who suffered. Now, do you know what remains in me deeply? It's the deep love of the ones who came first before me in my faith. You know, the people who evangelized me, these were two missionaries, foreign missionaries who came from a different country and they evangelized me. They left their homes. And then, you know, at UCLA, we had this mission center and they had no support, no financial support. And so they worked at a sushi restaurant right near the campus. So every day they worked at the sushi restaurant and, and sometimes I would even visit the sushi restaurant and then, you know, I would, uh, I would receive sushi from them. Of course, I would give them a big tip, but uh, nonetheless, you know, like they would serve me even at that sushi restaurant. And so, you know, this is how they were. They would serve me the word, they would serve me, you know, my meal, and they all did this to support the church. And, you know, I remember that deep love that remains with me. It's a fruit of the vineyard. You know, this, this is like a, a fruit of the vineyard that's completely different than a, a denarius, right? I mean, you earn a denarius and you're just going to spend it on, on bread and eat the bread and then it's gone, right? And that's it. But the fruit of love, the fruit of the vineyard, that, that, that remains with me. That deep love, I, I remember that. I really remember that. And so, you know, we must remember that. We must know that, that in actuality, there are people that came before me. You know, I, I'm here like fighting about my own standard of fairness, whether first or, you know, I came at 6, 6 a.m. and there's these 5 p.m. guys and they're earning the same denarius. But, 
you know, this is very true. I am the last ones. I'm not the first ones. I'm the one that came last and there's other people before me. You know, I always have to remember this. I am in the position of the last one. Everybody, we're all in the position of the last one. You know, it's in my own self-centeredness that I think I'm the first one. It's not true. <laughs> this is not true at all. Right? We, we, by our own self-centeredness, we think we're in the position of the first ones, but we forget that we are on the foundation of others. Right? There are other people that came before me. Even at church, it is like this. There's other people that came before me. There are people that were missionaries who suffered. There's generations, centuries of missionaries who suffered for, for faith. Right? And, and came and, and built the foundation for the churches that we have now. And we forget that, that we're here. My faith and where I am is built on the foundation of others. And like Jesus, there were ones that suffered carrying the cross to open a new world of resurrection for us. Right? That is what the gospel is. It is cross and resurrection. There are people that were before me that carried the cross. And because of their suffering, they opened up a new world, right? And they built a new foundation. And I'm living on that foundation of other people. And so we should not forget that, that we are the last ones and that they were first before me. But not only are we the last ones, but as Jesus says here, we are the first ones too, right? We are the first ones. Because there are ones that will come after us. Right? There are people that are also going to come after us. You know, you can think about it this way. You know, science and technology, it moves in, in this way also. You know, I mean, it's pretty clear, I think, in science and technology. You now, uh, what was it, 40, 50 years ago or whatever it was, we sent a man to the moon. Right? And there was all this, you know, you know, you look at those rockets and the space shuttles and they were so huge and there was all this computing power. You know, we, I mean, th this is a lot of how our technology and computing power form is, you know, the race to get a man to the moon in space like that. But if you look at all that computing power that it took to send that man to the moon, you know, we have that all right now, you know, on our phones. It's all right here now. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's how, that's how they calculate it. You know, all the little transistors and the computing power and the CPU and all of that, it's all right there on the phone now that they use to send a man on the moon. So, you know, technology and science is interesting like that. It keeps like pushing and, and moving forward. You know, do we live like past people did? You know, we don't, right? You know, I mean, the civilization, mo modernity and the science and technology that we have, it's not that we live like, like past people did. We get their benefits, right? Uh, based on the, the suffering and the work that they had, we get their benefits. And in the same way, technology that is built now is used later on too, right? What we are developing now in science and technology, people five, 10 years from now, they're gonna be built based on that and things that we use are, are gonna be obsolete. So, you know, in technology, you really see this, this way where it's like first and last, like together, right? You come to really get this, you get to see this. And the ones who came last, they get all the benefits of the same, of, of the first ones, right? Because we build on their foundation, we get all the benefits of their first. It's, it's, it's like the parable says, we get the denarius, right? We get all the benefits, we get all the denarius of the first ones. So outwardly, the denarius seems the same. We, you know, it seems like we get all the benefits and, and the denarius, it all seems the same. But we have to know, what we, what we should remember is that the first ones, um, there is a difference, right? There is a difference. Even though the denarius is the same, the first ones are remembered qualitatively different than the last ones, right? There's always something like this. Right, if there, for example, is there's a, a championship sports team, right? If there's a championship sports team, that everybody on the team is a champion. You know, I'm a champion, you're a champion, everyone. We're world champions. That's what everyone says on, on, a, on a championship sports team. Whether you're the, the first ones who are, who are playing and, and, and the stars, or whether you're the last one off the bench, you know, everyone is a championship. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's the glory of the kingdom of God, too. We're all champions in Christ, 
right? even whether you're first ones or last ones, we all go to heaven. And, you know, that's the glory of being a champion in Christ. But then on the championship team, the first ones, the first ones off the bench that do all the work and are all the stars, of course, they have, there's a qualitative difference in their championship, right? I mean, they do receive glory in that way because it's qualitatively different. Even though the championship is the same, but of course they receive more glory because they're the first ones, right? And so in that way, there is something like that where God knows our hearts, right? God, he doesn't forget suffering. God doesn't forget suffering, right? The eternal God, he remembers, he never forgets. And so, you know, there is this kind of thing deeply embedded in the message of the vineyard. In fact, you know, why is Jesus using the vineyard in order to speak about this parable? It's that there's symbolism behind it. There's symbolism that we can learn and understand about this, about this really deep embedded message of the vineyard, this deep difference in the one who, who came first. So let's look at John chapter 15, verse 5. John chapter 15 and verse 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's that Jesus is the vine. He's the root. Right? Jesus is the vine. He is the root. It's that Jesus, he says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. It's that from the vine, right? there's the vine, and then there's the branches that go off the vine, and off the branches are the fruit. Right? This is sort of how a, 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 vineyard, a vine vineyard works. And so through the vine, Jesus has the vitality of life. The branches, the branches are very shabby. That's us, right? We're the shabby branches that go off the vine. But amazingly, by grace, it is the fruit that grows off the branches. But how, how does that fruit grow? It's only because of the vitality of the life from the vine. It's the vine that gets all the nutrients and does all the work and brings up all the, the nutrients and gets the water and, and all those things in order to grow the fruit. We're the shabby branches, but the fruit the fruit grows off of the branches due to the vitality of life from the vine. So, you know, when you really think about it, Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. What does that mean? Now, why does Jesus have the vitality of life that comes from the vine? It's because Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life with love, with his unconditional love and forgiveness. And through the cross, God resurrected him. And so through the cross and the resurrection, us branches gain a new life in Jesus Christ. You know, we have to really know that we are completely reliant on the first, on Jesus Christ. We're completely relying on Jesus Christ to live and to live a life of love. And we need to come to see a bigger picture here. You know, we need to be the ones that know this love. It bears, that's how we can bear fruit inside of us. You know, it's that when we know Jesus' love, when it enters me, when I open up my heart to Jesus' love inside of me, and we know his heart that he carried to the cross, then that love comes into me, and then it overflows, and then I carry the cross for the ones coming after me. You know, Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected. He opened up a whole new world, defeated Satan and death. And that love came to me. And the love, the vitality of life that came from the resurrection of Jesus, that flows into me. When that love flows into me and it overflows like that, then we can bear the cross for the ones coming after me. And through us, through Jesus, through Jesus and through us, we open up a whole new beautiful world for the ones coming after us. And when you look at it, when you look at this beautiful image of a vineyard, you know, isn't that a beautiful image when you really think about it, right? The love that's coming from Jesus who bore the cross and resurrected, that comes into me and I also bear the cross and that love overflows to others, right? That is really what the, what the message of the vineyard is. It is overflowing love like that. It is Jesus Christ who loved us and that overflowing love to others. 
where we are both the last ones because we receive the love from Jesus. We receive the reward from the first one. But we're also the first ones carrying the cross for the next ones overflowing with love like that. So, you know, shouldn't we open up our hearts in that way and build a beautiful church in that way? You know, our church should be like that. We must serve one another in love like that. That's what a beautiful church should be. That is why I say the vineyard is the church. You know, our church must model that, right? Where the love of Jesus comes into us, it overflows and to others, to the ones coming after me, we serve one another in love, right? This is the beautiful message of the vineyard. You know, why should life be like fighting over denarius? Right? That's what the world is. That's how the ugly, ugly image of the sinful, depraved world is. It's fighting over denarius, you know, comparing my denarius to another denarius, trying to one-up each other on our status. You know, why is the world so ugly and depraved in this image, fighting over denarius in this way? Life should be like a vineyard. Life should be where, like a church, like the church that, that we are building. We must serve one another in love, and that is how we can live a beautiful life. Now, in the end, in actuality, God is doing it all. You know, all we have to do is have faith. Open up our hearts and have faith to amazing love of Jesus on the cross. You know, it all comes from, from Jesus. It's not me doing it. You know, I think I, I'm doing it and I'm fighting over denarius, but it's not it. You know, I'm receiving from Jesus and that love overflows in me. And so, you know, really, let us not be the ones stuck in our own existence living by my own standard. But instead, let us rely on the Father, right? For he is building a great vineyard in the world beyond imagination. He is building a great vineyard in our church. I hope that we can be the ones that are both uh, the first and uh, be, be, be the first ones, know the grace of being the first ones, but also carry the cross in that way and being the last ones. Do you know the meaning of the cross. It's this precious cross given to us. I hope we can be the ones to live by the cross and live for his glory. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, uh, as we deeply embed the message of the parable of the vineyards in our heart, Lord, we come to see our own self-centeredness, our own standard that we live by, Lord, that so very often we are um, so self-righteous and arrogant inside of ourselves, Lord. And in that way, Lord, we, we become lost, right? Fighting over denarius, comparing with one another. Lord. But instead, Lord, of living by our own standard, we wish to live looking at you, Lord, and your amazing grace in our life. We come to see, Lord, that your history, time and history, just keep moving forward, Lord. And you are building your, your vineyard, you're building, uh, Lord, you're building our church in that way with overflowing love. We wish not to be the ones living in this world, fighting over the sinful nature, being envious of one another over the denarius, Lord. But we wish to be the ones living like the vineyard in our church. We who have received the love of Jesus Christ on the cross, our Lord, it has come into me and it overflows from me. And Lord, we are the, the last ones that have received that lo love, but we are also the first ones, Lord, through us, Lord, you're uh, opening up a new world for the ones coming after us. And we wish to live in this beautiful world of a, of a vineyard in that way. We thank you, Lord, for showing us this and allowing us to deeply embed this grace and love in our hearts. And in Jesus Christ's name I prayed. Amen. <laughs>